uh, we're saying that we need to rediscover the value of the church. It, it says, I, I believe in the in Matthew 16, when Peter confessed the fact that um, Jesus was the Christ, that he was the son of the living God, Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. So we know from the beginning that he is the builder of the church, amen? And, and that we are part of what God wants to do. And, and today I, I'd like to touch on the fact of, of rediscovering the church that we need, amen? Because there's, there, there's a, a work that God wants to do in our hearts. It says in, in Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 32 and 33, it says, The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And then verse 33 says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. How many know that grace... Amazing grace, we all need grace for our lives. And we know that Jesus is a grace giver. And the church is to be a grace place. The church is a place where we should serve up grace. Amen? The church people, all of us need grace. We need God's grace. And today we are talking about doing life with the church as a core of your life. The, 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 the church is, is, becomes a very important part of our family. It, it becomes something important in what we're doing. And, and, and choosing a church is a very important and vital piece of living a full and purposeful life. Because it, it was God's idea to have church. It, it was His idea to, to form church. It, it was Jesus Christ that went to the cross so that He could build His church. Amen? But not everyone has the same experiences in church. And obviously not all churches are the same. And my heart is to help you discover or rediscover that there's a great joy and there are amazing benefits in finding and connecting to a biblically based church. And last week we went through a series of benefits. Amen? God gives us benefits. Amen? And we begin to look at the benefits of belonging. But you know, for millions of Americans, uh, the church is like a relic of the past. It's like a, a relic of past generations that, that for them they think the church is not relevant to their life. Or, or it's not truly on the top of their interest list. And as one person put it, he said, Church as I know it usually leaves deep parts of me dormant, unawakened, and untouched, and I don't much like church. You know, when you think about these things, and, and we know what people are saying all around, the reality is this, though, is I am a believer in the church. Because it's God's leading edge to His work in the world, whether it has watts or not. Amen? There's no place that is perfect, but it's God's instrument to reach the world for the kingdom of God. I read some different perspectives on church. There was a mother giving instruction to her three children as she sent them to Sunday school. And one of them asked her, why is it necessary to be quiet in church? And, and the son responded quickly, it's because people are sleeping. <laughs> There's a preacher's five-year-old daughter that noticed that the father would pause and bow his head for a moment before he started his sermon. And he was, he was touched that, you know, this particular girl actually noticed. And he said, well, honey, he began, I I'm proud that you've observed that before I speak my messages, but I'm asking the Lord to help me to preach a good sermon. And she said, well, then, how come he doesn't do it? There's another young boy after a church service on a Sunday morning. He announced his mother, Mom, I've decided to be a minister when I grow up. And she said, well, what made you decide that? He said, well, I have to go to church on Sunday anyway, and I figure it'd be more fun to stand up and yell than to sit down and listen. 
another Sunday school teacher challenge her children to take some time on Sunday afternoon to write a letter to God. And they would bring this letter back the following week, uh, on the following Sunday. And one little boy wrote this. He says, Dear God, we had a good time at church today. Wish you could have been there. <laughs> one more little girl was restless when the preacher's sermon was dragging on and on. And finally she leaned over to her mother and says, Mommy, if we give him the money now, can we go? <laughs> There's a lot of different perspectives about church. But you know, the church is what God is building. Amen? Amen. And I want to look at the church that we need because the first thing in a church that we need is that the church needs to be like its founder. Amen. Our desire is to focus, to be more like Christ every day so that when people look at us, they see His love. They see His character. They see His nature in us. And our redemptive power as a church is to be a church that has Jesus in everything we do. It's not to do other things, and I know this is a tall order, but we are to resemble Jesus, and we are to relate to others like Jesus would relate. The church that we need also needs to be a church where people can find friendships and relationships and a genuine community. Because community is made up of people who are not perfect. And we don't pretend to be perfect. Amen? But we are committed to invest our time. We are committed to invest our energy. We are committed to invest our life in each other. We accept one another. We, we forgive one another. We develop an ever deepening relationship with each other. Our, our souls connect with each other. We, we share our weaknesses. And when sin surfaces, when failure rises up, it must be met with grace. God's grace. Where, where, the, where the irritation can be softened, where, where the holy desire in our lives would grow. The church we need is a church where people can find healing. Because God is a God of healing. Amen? He can heal bodies. God can restore health. He can heal emotions. He can create hopes where there is despair. He can heal spirits that are bringing wholeness where there is brokenness. The, the church we need is a church where people are spiritually transformed. The, the Bible says, you know, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, the, the church we need should be challenging us in a way that we can be changed into a brand new person. The church we need is a church where people can raise their family as part of an extended family. We had this discussion on Thursday evening's Bible study and how, how you know, in the church the way God's intended to be is to have a, a nuclear family that's part of an extended family. That's with normal mothers and grandparents and aunts and uncles. There's your extended family. But that extended family is to be part of a church family. And that's why we have scriptures like Titus 2 and older women teaching younger women and older men being an example for younger men and, and all of the interaction and how in, in our society today it's almost like the nuclear family. Everyone thinks that it somehow exists to, to somehow springboard the individual to live his life with individuality. That's not the way God purposed it. God purposed us to be part of a family. Because you know what? Your family becomes your social security. Your family becomes your support system. Your family becomes your encouragement to be able to walk around. Your family gives you the wisdom you need from the years of experience. The church we need is a church that inspires people to dream and enables them to fulfill their dream. We believe that every purpose, every person has a purpose in life. Amen. Every one of us, God's given us a destiny. He's given us a dream that He's put within you and that dream needs to be fulfilled. And we should challenge every person. Take the lid off your life. Begin to dream about what God can do in you and through you and let Him come alongside and strengthen you and equip you and help you develop the God-given gifts within you. The church we need is a church where every race and age of people belong. We are a, a multi-racial, multi-cultural, multi-generational church. 
where people can come together because we are one in Christ. All races, all ethnicities, all cultures, a faith community where many faiths and, and I'm sorry, many races, much diversity, a oneness, a common identity in Christ makes a context where the whole family of God can be together. We make our focus to be a, a bridge church. We're bridging all people into God's presence. Amen? The church we need is a church where the people are passionate about God. We're passionate about God. Why? Because God's passionate about everything He sets His hands to do. We also must be passionate because we have been made in His image. Amen? And so we, we want to pray with passion. We want to worship with passion. We even want to greet you with passion. Amen? The church that we need is a church where people can fully embrace the vision and mission that God has given us. A vision to build people into fervent followers of Christ who are reaching out, who are impacting communities, who are impacting cities, who are impacting nations, all for the kingdom of God. The church we need is a church where people are taught the Bible and good sound doctrine. We desire to know the God of the Bible, to know what is taught in the books of the Bible. We're a place where the Word of God is central, where the Word of God is important, where the Word of God is valued, where the Word of God is taught. Amen? And that sound doctrine becomes something that is very practical in our life. Husbands love your wives. As Christ is head of the church, give yourself for her. Amen? There's some very practical aspects of what doctrine really is. The church we need is a church where people love their city and they become involved. We desire to be a people who know how to actively look for ways to meet the needs of all the people, of all different walks of life all around us. We want to be those that can give love. We want to be those that can give acceptance. We want to be those that can give guidance and encouragement to the hurting, to the discouraged, to the depressed, to the frustrated, to the confused that are all around us in our cities. Amen? Going to church will and should be and should give me a better life. But it also should help me change my world. The world around me. My world and the world around me. Something that God does in us. The church that we need is a church where people can experience love. Where they can experience acceptance. Where they can experience the grace of God. We want to create a climate of acceptance and openness where we can be devoted to each other. When someone falls, we restore them with love and compassion. When they succeed, we rejoice with them for their success. The church is a place of racial and, and, and radical, I'm sorry, and incomprehensible grace. And that's where our heart and our focus should be. I want to talk about that this morning, about the church as a place of grace. It says in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace, by grace grace you have been saved through faith and not of our, yourselves for it is a gift of God one person said this grace is relentless and it's something is pursuing us all there's God's grace that is pursuing us and, and it's God's grace that enabled us to be saved no one is beyond the reach of a loving God Amen? No matter what you've done, what you think you've done, you know, God's grace is sufficient to touch you. It's amazing when you think about the wonder of grace. Amazing grace, the hymn. Just on Amazon.com itself, it lists 3,832 different separate recordings of John Newton's old hymn in every kind of style imaginable. Everyone sings it, everyone knows it, everyone loves it. Why? Because God's grace is what enabled us to walk this walk. Amen? Amen. Augustine said this, God always pours His grace into empty hands. You feel empty today, you just open up your hands because God can pour His grace in your life. Jones said this, grace means unmerited favor 
or the kindness shown to one who is utterly undeserving. It's not merely a free gift. It's a free gift to those who deserve the exact opposite. It's given to us while we are without hope, without God in the world. This grace that God has given to us is an amazing thing. It's God's grace while we are undeserving. We didn't earn it. We, we, we surely weren't up for it. Yet God loved us so much. This grace is a gift that comes from Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, The Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, who was full of grace and truth. In verse 17 it says, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That there's this grace and truth. That, you know, the two are coupled together. If you have truth with no grace, it becomes legalistic. But when you have truth with God's grace, you have God's love that's extended to you. Even when you're undeserving, you can speak the truth in God's love. Amen? Amen. And grace is this surprising gift that comes when you are not seeking it, when you're, it's unmerited, but it's unlimited. Amen? You didn't go looking for it, but it overtook you. Amen? God's love was shown, and no matter what you have done, it doesn't matter the depth of our transgression or the darkness of our hearts, grace overwhelms us. Amen? It says in 1 Peter 5.10, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. You know, God's grace is something that doesn't matter what you go through in life, that God's grace is there for you. Amen? We can always call upon God's grace. God's grace overshadows us in times we couldn't even imagine. I don't know about you, but there have been some times in my life, maybe that I've been crying out, maybe I've just been crying. I don't know. But all of a sudden, God's presence would come. His grace would come. Not because I deserved it, but because He just showed His love upon me. Grace is abounding with mercy for anyone and everyone. There is no limit to what God will do to manifest His grace and the overflowing of His mercy. A moment of grace in our life can change our life. Amen? That, that maybe for all of eternity because of God's grace that has been shown to us. It says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 13 and 14, Paul saying this, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love and which are in Christ Jesus. Oh, he's full of grace and truth. It's His grace that changes lives. It's His grace that transforms our life. It's His grace that enables us to sense the love of God. This grace is an unconditional love. It says in 1 John 4, verse 8 to 10, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in this the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is saying here that, that even when you are undeserving, God sent His Son to the cross to bear your sins, to bear my sins, that anything that was on our account was paid for already by Him. God's grace. Unconditional love of God is absolute. It's something that is undeserved. And it's not limited by a condition. It's not limited by how you respond. It's not limited by anything that you do as an individual. 
This, this is something that is mind-boggling. This is something I think that, that except, uh, uh, somehow upsets our apple cart, you know? It, it's an unimaginable love that God would love me in this way when I didn't earn it. This is something that just sometimes gives us some headaches. That, that God would love us absolutely unconditionally, not because you are lovable. Not because you make him or I make him feel good. In Romans 5 verse 6 to 8 says, When we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do you come to an understanding of that? How can you come to an understanding of that without being overwhelmed with the love of God? The fact that He has done something for us. Look, it says in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 to 8, The Lord did not set His love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, because He would keep the oath which He swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. He has redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. See, unconditional love of God is absolute and undeserved, and it's not limited by the conditions of life. Amen. It's not conditioned by how you've responded to God. It's not conditioned by what you have done. He put His love upon you. He chose you from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the earth. God has chose you. Yes, you must walk by faith. But it's God's grace that enables you to walk by faith. How often have we tried to change somebody else's life by somehow trying to change their mind? And, and it's important that we change their mind. But apart from God's grace... Nothing will happen. Maybe you've lived as a Christian for many years and you're kind of walking through almost in a legalistic way trying to somehow apportion the things of what the Word of God says but you constantly walk in some kind of condemnation because you can't live up to what the Word says. But the Bible says there is no condemnation to the people that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? The reality is this, is that none of us can walk that way. You can't start the journey one way and try to finish it a different way. I don't know what happens sometimes. People have walked for years and you would think they're maturing. You think somehow something's undoing. But, but somehow, I don't know, we, we start thinking we know something. We, we start getting the wrong idea we've deserved something. We, we start beginning to think we've earned something. And we watch somebody else come to the Lord. We watch somebody else come to the church. And you know what? Our nose goes up. And, and, and our attitude toward them is wrong. And you know, I, I think that if we can understand like the Apostle Paul, that the longer that he walked with the Lord, the more he understood that he was chief of sinners. There was no good thing in him. Let's be real. Let's understand that all of us have a heart that would stray from God. All of us has a propensity towards sin, but we understand somehow God chose me. He showed His love upon me. He showed me His great mercy when I was undeserving of that mercy. This great grace that God showed me in my life is enough to undo me. This love that God has shown me is not based on anything I do. It's not based on anything you do. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more. He does not withhold love. 
He does not give love based on merely a criteria. Some of us think, you know, it's like, like you know, you, you have a relationship in your marriage and something's not going good and somebody gives the other one the cold shoulder. And somehow we think that God's like that. Um, this hasn't been a good week for me and he's got his face turned from me. I don't even think he's walking with me. But the word of God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even the prodigal son's father looked on his porch every day. He looked a long distance. He looked for the return of his son. And when his son returned back, he wasn't thinking, Oh boy, am I going to give it to him now. Now I think I'll give him a piece of my mind. I, I think now I'll tell him, I told you so. No, the Bible says he ran down the road. And before his son could even utter any words, he had grabbed his neck and he began kissing him. There was this love of God that was reaching out to the, the son that had said, Give me whatever you have and I want it for myself. The love of the Father. How many know his hand is not, his arm is not too short? And his love is not too shallow. But he can't restore us. But he can't do a great work in our life. When he gives us scriptures like Galatians that said, you who are mature, if you see your brother at fault, restore him. And do it with a, a spirit of meekness, realizing that only by God's grace are you standing. How would it transform us as a body of believers if we begin to walk according to the grace that God has given to us. It says in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He's made us acceptable in the Beloved. You've been accepted by nothing more than God's grace. His unmerited favor, His mercy that He's shown upon you. It says in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, Though the Lord's mercies, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. And because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness. God is faithful, amen? He's faithful in our life. He has been faithful through the years. I think it, 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 I think it's a time for us to begin to worship right now. We want to begin to th look and say, God, you have been faithful in our life. And, and you know, I don't care what your need is this morning. I don't know what you came in with. And I don't know if you've been heavy burdened in any kind of way. But I want to lift your spirit today. To know that God is able to show you his love no matter what you've been through in life. And that His forgiveness can continue to flow every single day of your life. And when that forgiveness begins to flow, when you begin to understand His unmerited favor to you, it changes the way you serve Him. Until we understand that, we are serving Him in a legalistic way. Oh, I must go to church today. Oh, I must give some kind of an offering. Oh, I've got to go through this ritual of songs. I've got to follow Pat, clap her hands so that I could be on tune. You know, because everything's about what do I need to do to perform right? It's not about a performance. It's about receiving something. Lord, pour out your grace in my life. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your great grace. I might have chose a different path. I don't know how I've been kept. But I've been kept by your grace. Lord, it's your grace that's done all this to us. It's your grace that's enabled us to be here today. It's your grace that enables us to be able to hear your word. It's your grace that enables me to turn from my sin. It's all about your grace. Now, I'm not saying 
The word doesn't say, because of God's grace, I should live in sin. God forbid. Amen? Amen. But because of what he's done for me, changes the way I see him. He gives me the strength. He gives me the ability. He, he will help me go through the trial. He'll give me the ability to rebound if I've fallen down. Because he always shows his love and his mercies every morning. They come again. They come again. They come again. Oh God, how you could be so patient with your people. How, Lord, you can endure. How we turn to the right. And we turn to the left. And, and like a sheep without a shepherd, we go astray. Oh. But when no one else was able to do something, in the fullness of time, He sent us Jesus. And he was full of truth. But he was also full of grace. Lord, I pray. Today may we receive your grace. As we receive your truth. That it might transform our lives. And it may cause us to open our lives in a, a brand new way in our worship before you. Oh, we glorify you, Lord. Help us, even as we have shared so many things. Help us be the church we need to be. We glorify you. We thank you, Lord. Be with us as we, as we sing this song today, Lord. Be with us as we, as we come before you, Lord. Lord, if there be anyone here that's in need, if there be anyone here that needs healing, Lord, let them reach their hand before you. Say, Lord, by your grace, I will stand. If there's anyone here that needs forgiveness, Lord, let, let it stand before you. Say, God, forgive me. Let your mercy and let your love overshadow anything that I've done in the past. Thank you for cleaning the slate. Lord, if we've been walking in judgment with others, Help us today. Just stand before you and say, God, I thank you that you have not judged me. But my sin's been judged already on the cross. And you've shown your mercy. And you've shown your love. Help me now, Lord, as you have taught us to forgive others as we've been forgiven. May we be a place of healing. There would be a place of hope. We may be a place where people can know the truth and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this, Lord, work in our own hearts today. We bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.